Hey, good morning. Hey, oh, good morning. So you can see how confused I am. Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, I, I apologize for uh, holding people up. This is the first time I've walked in and everybody's ready and I'm not here to say welcome. I'm, I'm, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, but I've got too many things going on here, here today. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS. And we're uh, given an opportunity uh, today to really host uh, the rollout of uh, two, two very interesting studies. I've had a chance to, to read them. And uh, uh, quite important to introduce these, this analysis into the Washington policy landscape. Uh, you know, America has been struggling <laughs> over the last several years to kind of restart its, uh, its nuclear industry. And uh, of course the great uh, challenge facing nuclear is the long gap between your commitment to do something and getting electrons that come out of the plant that you can start generate revenue. And it's always been the, the great, and this is now turning into seven, eight, nine years kind of a lag. And there are very few companies that uh, have the financial throw weight to take on a $10 billion obligation, you know, put that money at risk for eight and nine years, and then start to see a revenue stream. You know, this is a, this is a real problem. And of course, it's, uh, there are probably no merchant suppliers of energy that are able to do that. Regulated utilities at least have the capacity to put something like that on a, on a, on a rate base. But even then, that's becoming problematic some places. And so one of the most interesting developments in recent years has been the so-called small modular reactor. Um, it offers uh, the promise of you know, a factory construction efficiencies and uh, a much shorter timeline so that you can see, you don't see this huge gap and lag in seeing revenue to offset capital costs. I mean, it's an, so it's an interesting idea. But there hasn't been authoritative work in front of us as to this trade-off between the, uh, the value of scale that you get with large reactors, but the time latency problems that come with large-scale construction versus the inefficiency of modular uh, reactors, but having them available on a much shorter and growable pattern. So it's a very interesting problem. Fortunately, it's a problem that can be analytically solved, or at least studied. And uh, <laughs> whether we have the national will to do something, that's another question. I'm not sure that's probably not on the table today, but we, it certainly can be augmented with knowledge. And that's what we're going to treat ourselves with today. Uh, we're very lucky that, the, that our colleagues from the University of Chicago have been studying this. And they called and said, uh, wouldn't you like to hear from this, about this from us? And I said, well, only if Vic Reese would show up. And so fortunately, <laughs> we drug Vic in. Vic, Vic has been bugging me about this for several years. So it's a great opportunity for all of us. I thank all of you for coming. And I think we should now turn it over to you, Chance. So let's, let's get this thing going for real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I especially would like to thank uh, CSIS for being the host uh, for this, uh, uh, this presentation. What we're going to do is I'm going to give, uh, try to be reasonably brief and go through my talk, and then uh, we're going to uh, try to turn to questions. I, I, I suspect that there are going to be lots of questions, lots of discussion, and we really encourage it. Um, an essential point about uh, what I'm about to say is that we view this really as a start of a conversation because many aspects of what I'll be talking about are, uh, are uh, questions that we're raising, issues that we're raising. We think that, we believe on balance that, uh, uh, that we do have a case to be made, uh, but it's a case that has to be argued out and uh, thought carefully about. And as you just heard, ultimately, it will be translated hopefully into national policy. And there is a long distance between what we're doing right now and actually implementing national policy. So, um, uh, uh, first, uh, uh, just a very short word about what EPIC is. EPIC is um, uh, the University of Chicago's first uh, uh, venture into uh, energy policy, uh, energy environmental policy. Uh, it was just started uh, earlier this year. I'm the founding director of it. 
um, uh, if you ask why yet another energy policy institute, the answer is we think that Chicago has a particular role to play, uh, both because uh, Chicago, from the point of view of economic analysis, uh, it has a kind of a brand about how we go about doing our business. And then, of course, we also manage a, 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 a important energy lab. So we have the technical background, the resources to draw on to actually being able to do analysis that uh, t uh, basically draws both on technical expertise, uh, uh, basic sciences, applied sciences, engineering, but also from the economic sciences and social sciences. So, uh, so that's why I'm really here. I'm, I'm particularly pleased. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a physicist, so I have to confess that I'm not a social scientist. Um, and uh, some of what I'll be saying, uh, you'll probably guess that, yeah, I'm probably a physicist. So for example, I'm uh, death on point estimates of anything. I mean, a point estimate to me means nothing unless you have some notion of, for example, errors. I think it's a good idea. So. Um, uh, the scope of the study was really defined uh, originally by the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy came to us and said, uh, uh, you folks had done uh, a study back uh, in 2004 on, uh, uh, on the economic future of uh, nuclear energy, and could you update it? And then the update really takes two forms, one having to do with the focus on the, what you might call the classical, uh, classical reactors, the gigawatt-scale reactors. Uh, the other is the is possible new generation of reactors, modular reactors. And you just heard the key question will be to uh, what kind of advantages accrue from building modular reactors as opposed to the traditional way of building reactors. So uh, uh, you can find, uh, if you don't have copies of, uh, of the report, you can find them on our website at EPIC, and here are the, uh, uh, the instructions. So um, first, let me just uh, talk just for one moment about um, the gigawatt scale nuclear plants. Um, uh, if uh, some years ago there was a there was a, a, among some circles there was a, a view that we might have a nuclear renaissance in the United States based on a gigawatt scale reactors, and if you just look at how many reactors are being built, it's clear that we're not in the midst of such a renaissance. It's not that they're not being built; they are being built, uh, but there are very few of them. And of course, the issue really is the economics. I mean, the economics for these plants uh, in, under current circumstances, uh, depending very much on the details of uh, the, the market in, in states, is it, a, is it a, a market economy or not, uh, that really matters. And so, uh, for example, in Illinois, it is extremely unlikely that we'll be building gigawatt scale reactors anytime soon. If you talk to Exelon, you'll find that out. So, so we think that there are real uh, reasons for, the, uh, for these economic uh, uh, penalties that these large reactors have. And you, you just heard just a moment ago, but some of them, they really do have to do with the uncertainties in the process of actually getting from uh, an original design concept to actually putting something on the ground and building it. And it's a bit of a challenge. Um, now, when we looked at, the, uh, at uh, small modular reactors, um, it turns out, to no surprise, uh, there are certain uh, issues that came up that um, were really not issues at all in the gigawatt scale reactors. There are really new issues to think about. Uh, one of, uh, and we really had to face um, uh, sort of plow new ground here. Um, some of it has to do with the fact that uh, these are uh, new designs and uh, ultimately when you're in the market to sell these, what you really are interested in is what are the nth of the kind costs, that is once you have uh, climbed up the learning curve, uh, what do you actually end up? What is the actual cost uh, for, uh, expressed either as, uh, uh, you know, as levelized uh, cost of electricity or uh, ultimately, uh, you know, what money do you have to put in for capital construction costs? Um, that's one issue. The other issue, of course, uh, has to do with uh, exactly what is the learning curve like? How many, how many units do you have to build in order to actually get to nth of kind costs? Uh, what is the competitive marketplace? Uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, we're talking about, for example, natural gas prices, not today, but 10, 15 years from now, when these kinds of reactors will actually hit the market. And um, I think it's fair to say that it's a risky proposition to guess what the uh, uh, gas price is then, especially uh, given uh, our lack of knowledge of, of whether or not natural gas prices in the United States will at some point again be coupled to uh, the uh, oil price the way it is uh, in the international forum. Um, here in the United States, it's been protected from that, but, uh, but not internationally. Um, there are lots of 
uh, issues that relate to whether or not uh, uh, SMR investments are worthwhile uh, for the government, uh, to what extent uh, government has an interest, an active interest in this. And then finally, and I think we really believe this is key, in order to actually make this work, um, you need, do need to climb the learning curve. And that means uh, for the vendors, this means that they need to be assured of an order book. And the, the key question is how do you construct an order book early on so that you can actually convince uh, the vendors to actually make the upfront investments to actually build, uh, uh, build a plant that can, uh, that can construct these uh, kinds of reactors. Now, um, it turns out uh, size matters in some cases, and this is one of the cases where size matters, meaning uh, that um, uh, think of who the customers are. The customers ultimately are going to be uh, the utilities, and in the case of the gigawatt scale plants, of course, the key issue has always been that the capital construction costs for the, these kinds of plants are very large compared to the capitalization uh, of, uh, of the utilities. Uh, here, you're, uh, what you're seeing is the average capitalization, but as you probably know, uh, even the largest of the, uh, of the nuclear utilities, uh, nuclear vendors rather, um, uh, power vendors, uh, Exelon, in their case, uh, they're not all, all that much higher than this number. And so for them to go after a plant uh, where you're talking about for a uh, plant site of the order of $12 billion, where the capitalization might be 25 to $30 billion, you really are betting the, uh, the company. And that's a risky, risky proposition. And that's then reflected back in the, uh, in the risk evaluation by the market. It's going to cost you money uh, when you go to the market and uh, want to borrow. So that's reflected in the cost of these kinds of plants. So that is the sense in which size matters. Because as you're able to reduce the capital upfront capital construction costs, the, the risk capital, of course, becomes much smaller. And uh, SMRs have this benefit that basically there, there's not as much risk to the company uh, as there is with the gigawatt scale plants. That's an important uh, factor in uh, the cost analysis for these kinds of plants. Um, Next is the issue of uh, learning. And uh, here I want to be very clear about what the issue really is. Um, uh, in the case of uh, large reactors, uh, given the typical build rate that we've seen over the last uh, 20 years, which is extremely low, um, you have to ask yourself, what kind of learning has taken place? Well, the answer is essentially no learning, fundamentally, because at each site that these plants are being built, you're basically training the workforce anew for building that plant. Um, if that is the case for these kinds of reactors, of course, uh, the game is up. You're not going to be able to, there will be no learning. The key element of the learning curve is that you have a workforce in a plant that becomes experienced. You're not at each site uh, train, retraining uh, or training a new uh, a, a workforce from scratch. These are not stick-built plants. They're modular units that are then brought on site. And the key element, the learning curve, really has to do with the workforce. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, more than half of the capital construction costs of a, of a nuclear plant actually is in the labor. So saving on the labor costs is a huge, huge element here. It's a very important element. And exactly what is the learning process? That's something I think that still needs some more work. I, when, when I talked earlier about uh, um, that this is just the beginning of the conversation, I think this is a key element. We really do want to understand better uh, what, the, what kind of learning can take place in an industrial environment and uh, this is a place where uh, more conversations with various kinds of vendors, but not only in the nuclear industry, but also outside the nuclear industry, uh, I think will prove very useful. And we want to be able to do that. Um, if you now look at uh, the kinds of learning curves we've, we've examined, uh, what you're seeing here are three learning curves. These are basically uh, what are called scenarios playing out. Uh, and what we're looking at here uh, is the levelized cost of electricity as a function of the number of units, uh, modules that are built. And of course, uh, what you're seeing here is also the competition from the most important competitor uh, for, uh, for these kinds of plants, which is natural gas. And the band that you see there for the uh, low and high end is, I think, uh, simply pre presumptive. I, uh, I, I would be foolish to say that th this is the band that will uh, be uh, operative in 10, 15 years from now. Nobody would believe me right, if I said that, and I'm not saying that. But uh, I think it's probably a pretty good guess that it's not going to be lower than what you're seeing there. It's likely to be higher, if anything, especially if the natural gas price gets tied to oil price the way it is uh, outside the United States. So what you're seeing there is that there is, in fact, an opening, depending on what the learning curve is like, 
where uh, these kinds of plants can in fact uh, compete in a marketplace where uh, natural gas is the primary competitor. And keep in mind that we're talking about units that are not be build, being built next year, the units that would be built 10, 15 years from now. Okay. Um, the estimates that, uh, that you just saw, so the, the, if you like, the green curve, the one in the middle, uh, has a bunch of assumptions in it. And it's useful to look at what the assumptions are. Um, uh, the, we were, it's in, in some cases, I would say fairly conservative. Uh, in other cases, not so. I, I think that, uh, for example, the point estimate for natural gas prices, uh, if you compare it to the price today, which is just around $4, um, uh, I would say is on the reasonably conservative side. I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, uh, particularly uh, optimistic. Um, uh, I think on the contingency end, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, the contingency for the first of the kind is going to be much larger. I think we would expect that. But the contingencies, once you get to infinite kind costs, uh, and that's the key point, uh, I think that number is actually a reasonable number. 15% for the very first plants is not reasonable, which is why, of course, the first plants are more expensive. Right? Um, if you ask um, uh, what are some of the uh, characteristics that make these kinds of plants particularly interesting for the marketplace, I think uh, here you see some of the key elements. One of them has to do with uh, the kind of market uh, that is in the United States that it would not be easily served by the gigawatt scale plants. For example, uh, replacement of the two to three, 400 uh, megawatt uh, uh, coal plants that are aging uh, that, uh, are, uh, that have been grandfathered under EP regs and that are likely to be phased out over the next decade. Uh, these kinds of plants uh, sit in, uh, in areas where the grid would not easily uh, accept a gigawatt scale facility, but could easily accept the kinds of plants that we're talking about. Um, if you look at uh, the uh, typical uh, rate adjusted cost of capital, I think um, uh, if you look at the nth of kind costs, these are actually not unreasonable. Uh, one key element that I think is a real game changer here, it has to do with the nature of the reactor itself. And that is that these are really uh, fully passive systems, meaning that they're sort of at the extreme of the evolution of nuclear, of new nuclear designs, plant designs, where you try to take human intervention during, uh, during uh, an emergency out of the uh, out of the equation. This is the direction in, in which many people have been urging the industry. And in fact, if, even if you look at gigawatt scale plants, uh, Gen 3, Gen 3 plus, they're already moving in that direction. And uh, this is basically sort of the extreme. In some of the designs, uh, some of you probably know, uh, the, uh, the entire heat load uh, at full power can be carried passively uh, by uh, thermal convection. There's no need for pumps. Um, now, none of this really makes much sense if you don't have a, uh, a business model. And uh, we can talk more during the question period about this a discussion period. Um, the key elements, are, in my view, are that uh, early on, what you'd like to do is encourage as many participants to take part uh, as possible. There, there is a lot to be said for let a thousand flowers bloom in the design space. Uh, the I interesting question will be how quickly uh, do you then narrow down uh, the technology choices? That's an interesting question. My personal view is don't do it too early. Don't, don't uh, uh, cast your bets too early because you do want to go through a fair degree of the design process. You want to go fairly far into the design process in order to know uh, uh, where you are in terms of the cost structure, what the likely learning curve is like to be, and in particular, what your likely nth of the kind costs are going to be which of course will determine whether or not you have uh, market potential or not. So uh, early on, you're really doing in the design phase. Uh, the design phase is designed to get you to build the very first plant. That very first plant will need to have a customer. And uh, we're suggesting that the likely customer is going to be in fact the federal government. It's not likely uh, to be industry. Um, then uh, building out to an order book, once you have a, a much better idea of what the ultimate cost will be, this is the, this is the point at which, this is stage three, uh, when um, uh, the vendors will now have to place their bets. 
uh, and uh, have to invest in order to set up the plant to then actually have the assembly line where the learning takes place. So the stage four is the learning, that's the learning stage. At this point, you've, you've completed the design, you're now in the, in the learning phase, and depending on how good you are and whether or not you have the order book to actually get there, um, you can then hopefully get to the uh, nth of the kind cost that I was talking about about before. The key element here, the key element here is uh, you need to have a story to tell about who constructs uh, that order book to begin with. And we believe that this is another place where uh, the federal government can actually play a very important role. Um, so if we look at um, the, overall, the overall case that we have, um, uh, we uh, as I said earlier, um, uh, I, I'm a deep skeptic about point estimates. What you can do is provide a kind of bounding analysis of what costs might be. And uh, that's basically uh, uh, what we've looked at. Uh, the key elements that, are, that underlie our analysis really has to do with uh, to what extent uh, are we successful in having a factory that really does experience learning um, uh, what are the real costs in actually setting such a facility up? Uh, what is the, uh, the scale of this facility? What, what will be involved on the vendor end to uh, actually make the investments? And in particular, how fast can they learn? This, the, if you look at the curves that we have, it's clear that the learning rate is, the, 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 the faster you learn, uh, the better off you are in the long term because you'll get to the point where you actually start making money faster. Um, uh, Okay, let me, I'm being told how much time I have and I have to speed up. Um, one, of the, um, one of the issues that always comes up here is uh, you want to, of course, um, be in a case where you don't just are pushing product out, but uh, you actually have market pull. That is that the market actually uh, uh, it supports you in, uh, in, uh, uh, in purchasing these plants. Early on, it's likely that uh, the only customers, especially for the lead and uh, uh, the, the first of kind plants, that it's going to be uh, the federal market. But eventually, uh, I, we believe there is a market out there that really is suited, well suited, well matched to the kind of reactors we're talking about. For example, in the foreign market, is uh, if you look at uh, the folks that are not currently uh, nuclear states, that is, they're not currently in the market, they have not yet made the transition to uh, putting up nuclear plants. Many of them uh, have grids that would find great difficulty in accepting gigawatt scale plants, uh, but would find uh, it relatively uh, well suited to have uh, reactors of this kind where the, where the uh, typical uh, megawatt rating is somewhere between 50 uh, to 150 megawatts. That is uh, much easier to absorb. Some countries that, um, that are, uh, would be in this market uh, might surprise you. Um, Poland is an example. Uh, Poland is an example of a country where uh, uh, building a gigawatt plant there is, remains a challenge because their grid is not suited yet to handle that kind of, uh, that, that kind of plant. But on the other hand, uh, the kind of plants we're talking about here are actually uh, uh, quite feasible. Of course, uh, to, to do that requires some work on the federal side, uh, 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 really rethinking how we deal with uh, export credits, uh, there needs to be some uh, coordination in the agency export strategy, which we currently don't have. Uh, I, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned uh, one of the uh, obvious uh, customers in the United States, which are all those utilities, uh, especially, for example, in uh, the coal states like Kentucky, where uh, they are currently running uh, a number, large numbers of coal plants, which have been grandfathered, uh, which are likely to go out of business within the next decade or so. And these are plants that have a scale uh, that actually uh, well within the scope of the kinds of plants we're talking about here. They're not gigawatt scale. They're not lo very large plants. They're more in the two to uh, 300 uh, megawatt range, much smaller. And uh, so uh, one of the key issues is that this relates very much to what the EPA finally is going to do with their regs. It's an interesting question. We'll see over the next uh, 12 months how that works out, uh, what the actual Clean Air Act rules are like, especially uh, clean, act, uh, clean Air Act rules for old plants, uh, which will definitely determine the future of those plants. 
So um, finally, um, let me just leave you with some thoughts. Um, I already mentioned what, what the issues are, the key ingredients. Um, one thing to be very clear about is that uh, up front, it is very important to be clear about the need to push the design engineering costs up front because we want to know uh, as early as possible whether or not these plants are actually economically viable. And that really means that you have to sort of front load the process. Um, uh, one of the interesting advantages of, of uh, the, uh, these kinds of technologies is that uh, the, uh, in principle, these ca the uh, uh, construction of SMRs can be highly vertically integrated within the United States. This is an area of manufacturing that would be very difficult to move offshore. And therefore, it's, uh, it, it's a kind of manufacturing to going toward green technologies that really is of the kind that people have talked about as generating green jobs. Um, one of the interesting challenges will be uh, for the NRC and for industry to think through um, uh, the rules for safety and security for these plants. Uh, they have certain huge advantages in this regard. For example, the fact that they're buried, they're, they're below grade, has important implications for, for example, on the security side. It really does change the picture when you worry about, for example, uh, airplane impact because you have to be awfully good at uh, targeting one of these. Um, so that's, that's a major issue. Um, exactly how the NRC deals with these issues it remains to be seen. And then, of course, the crucial issue at the very end is you're not going to go anywhere unless you have uh, investor acceptance. And this really has to do with this first mover. Somebody has to be a first mover to get this going. And we're arguing basically that, that the federal government has an important role here to play as a first mover. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. I want to pass on uh, what was said earlier about thanking everybody for attending. Uh, both uh, We have people also on webcast, and I want to thank those who are virtually with us as well. Um, I do want to recognize a few people in the audience before we start the Q&A. Uh, Kinette Benedict has joined us, and she is a partner in, the, in EPIC, and she's more than just a partner. She's also a very important consultant to us and has given us many, many great comments. Uh, Joe Heiser, who's up here at the podium on to my left, is a, was a very crucial person in the analysis, particularly the business case, uh, the budgeting issues, as well as uh, licensing strategy. Uh, Ed Davis, who's in the audience, supported us very, very importantly in the gigawatt level reactor analysis. <coughs> Uh, and who cannot be with us today is uh, Dr. Jeff Rothwell, who did a lot of the core and supplemental analysis. You may have noticed when you picked up the report that there was a number of people we had uh, consulted with in the industry, and there are some who are here, and we thank them very much, and I want to publicly thank the others who really supported us tremendously as we went through our working papers and got to a final copy. And, le and last but not least, there are a number of Department of Energy people here in the audience, including Vic, who was recognized earlier. And they always provide us with incredibly great counsel and many times good advice, but not all the time, just <laughs> say many times. Is that a but fair? But I would say uh, uh, forceful critiques. Forceful That's critiques. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. We're very interested in your questions. Okay, yeah. would you uh, also identify yourself? Uh, Peter Rosecrans, Lockheed Martin. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was interested in a chart that I think uh, Mr. Goldberg presented perhaps in a preliminary version of this at Platts, where you were analyzing levelized cost of electricity for large versus small, and how many small modules do you have to put together to where they're about equivalent. Right. Did, can you, now that the study is over, can you comment on your thoughts on that? Okay, we're trying to remember. That was back, I guess, in the springtime uh, when our thoughts have evolved. <laughs> um, and I'll do a good job, but not because I'm not sure I have that chart in my head very well. But let me see if I can try to remember it. What we were trying to do back then was we were looking at uh, volatility of natural gas. We had some assumptions made on historical natural gas prices and what could happen in the future. So we were trying at that time 
And we didn't have as much of the information on shale gas as we have today, so we had to change our analysis back then. But, but in that time, we looked and, and saw how nuclear large and small would play out for various natural gas futures. And as I recall, on the large nuclear, when we looked at that as a snapshot in time, that would be a deregulated uh, large utility that would have to go into the market to get market uh, rates for their large nuclear. So it would essentially be in a certain natural gas future at that time when we did it, which was probably higher, slightly higher than the natural gas prices you're looking at in the final report. As far as SMRs are concerned, when we did that preliminary analysis, we were looking at SMRs uh, for overnight costs that uh, we have gotten some more information from the vendors that helped us in more refining those costs. So I would say that these are the better estimates than there were when we did the preliminary analysis for plaques. So, so to get to the, what I was getting at, the, one of the challenges with small, of course, is if you have only a few megawatts and you have all the fixed costs associated with the site, uh, the levelized cost is going to be higher. Right. Right. At, at what and so one of the things we're interested in the industry is at what uh, number of modules or what total uh, capacity does large and small become more or less equivalent? Okay. Well, let's see if we can, because uh, there are a lot of variables in your question, but let's try it this way. If we're just dealing with uh, best, uh, the best uh, cost estimates that are, I would say best achievable cost estimates, which is nth of a kind, we looked at building up a case of uh, amortizing the fixed capital cost over one, two, three, five, and six. six. And we looked at uh, basically a 100 megawatt per module uh, scenario with a half plant being three and a full plant being six. And you probably have to have three to be able to get in the, into the ball game for uh, for what we had in our analysis. Now, there are, we've gotten a lot of comments on this from, from the vendors, uh, and I'll just call it generically vendors, and as some would argue, three is probably too large. We could do it for less than three. But we were using fairly conservative fixed capital assumptions for siting and for, uh, uh, for the structures around the RTG sets, the reactor turbine generator sets. So we were basically, I would say three is the sort of the number we were, we were striving toward. Joe, would you want to add to my no, explanation? I, no, I think that's a, that's a good estimate. I think, and that would be for, if you will, that once you get to a, if you will, end of a kind module in terms of just simply the economics of a particular site. My name is Robert Adams. I write for Atomic Insights. One of the questions I have on your modeling is how do you uh, model the volatility of natural gas prices uh, compared to historical natural gas prices? Back in the 1990s, we were told that natural gas was going to be cheap forever, and it wasn't. Uh, I'll answer. Uh, Dr. Rothwell is, was our expert here, and he's not here, but I will do a, my take on it. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bob to add. Uh, we looked at, we had a modeling uh, routine called at risk, and we looked at historical Henry Hub pricing over a period of time and projected out what kind of that volatility if it continued going forward. Having said that, uh, and Bob has sort of weighed in on this uh, during the peer review, felt that that is only one indicator that there are other indicators that will, will be more important going forward on gas prices, particularly on the BTU issue, BTU equivalent, and what's going to happen over time when SMRs will get into the marketplace, which, which will not be in the next two years, but more likely the next decade or two. So Bob, why don't you add to that? Yes, so maybe the thing to add is if you ask, you know, uh, what, what would hugely change the picture for national gas? It really has to do with uh, uh, the question of how much is there and is there enough so that for the folks that are actually producing the natural gas, that the export market and the, price, the, the money making advantage that you have for exporting becomes enough of a draw to then to start export. Once you start exporting, you have this interesting issue of whether or not you can maintain 
the price levels here in the United States at the level that they've been detached from uh, the oil price because that, that's the, that, that would be a huge change and very hard to predict. Yeah, hi. Uh, Paul Genoa with the Nuclear Energy Institute, and I uh, really appreciate the study and the opportunity to hear the presentation. And, it, it, and it's really clear we've all been thinking about the opportunities for learning in the manufacturing of the actual modules themselves, and that makes sense. Do you see additional analysis or do you see opportunities for, for additional learning uh, and, and improvements in the balance of plant? I mean. Uh, consortiums come together, teams going out, the same people doing the balance of plant work, uh, and do you envision doing more work along that line? Okay. Well, let me start, and I'm actually going to turn it over to Joe and Bob. Uh, we do envision more work, and we do envision uh, in the analysis, we, we were um, doing a fairly generic learning uh, we had three learning rates, one for fixed capital, one for variable capital, and a third for O&M. Uh, we applied that same learning rate across all uh, cost centers uh, from reactor to balance of plant, from NSSS to balance of plant. Uh, we know it's, it is a first approximation, and more work needs to be done in that area. Uh, Joe, do you want to add to yeah. no, I, As Steve described, we, we, we had a learning model uh, it was um, it really it was the first attempt to cr quantitatively try and create a learning model, and so uh, we think that it could be developed in further detail. We also think that, that there are opportunities to uh, for uh, economies and balance of plant, but we didn't try and estimate or quantify that in this first uh, part of what we did. Okay, we have a gentleman. And maybe I can just add. Okay. I think. One clear refinement is exactly along the lines that you're talking about, which is distinguishing between the reactor, the reactor part and the balance of plant. And clearly, the, re the learning rates are going to be quite different. In the latter case, we already, there's been a lot of learning here. has already happened, of course. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Kirk Schneblin with Urenko. Hey, a uh, question parallel to the gas price question. What uh, sort of uh, fuel cycle uh, were you envisioning for small modular reactors in terms of both uh, refueling cycle length uh, and uh, enrichment levels. Correct. Great question. Yeah. Uh, because this is a question that has come up a lot in our drafts and our conversation. And it's unfortunate we cannot pick the right one. We try to be generic. And when you're generic, you're, it's by definition wrong. Uh, we assumed a and I'm not going to, you it's in the, it's in the uh, report. We assumed a burn up effectively and a, uh, uh, a time of burn that is conservative of a batch refueling cycle, essentially, not a continuous refueling cycle. And in other words, you would batch out, you'd go three to four years and burn down. Now, what that means is that there's a penalty. We assumed a slight penalty for fuel cycle cost and compared to a gigawatt level uh, a conventional reactor. That, that does fortunately not make too much of a difference on the LCOE because, as you know, the fuel cycle cost is a small percentage of the overall levelized cost. But, but in fact, we have a penalty in the, embedded in the calculation. Bob, do you want to add to that? Uh, this, this is actually where, whoops. Where the, where the um, modular nature of the plant really does make a big difference because uh, you'd basically not refuel every module at the same time, right? And that's a very important point. Did, you don't mind the second one? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, did, did you have to make assumptions about how many people work at this plant? And and did you, vary, you know, did you vary that and see what kind of effect that made? Okay. Um, uh, this is a good question. Dr. Rothwell has, in his working papers, which we have posted, and you can find it on the Harris site, employees per site, we do have a labor assumption. Uh, how that, now this is where it gets really interesting, and going forward in our future work is important. 
when we did the um, a large report and Ed and Joe worked on it, we have sort of a pie chart on, on equipment, on people, on uh, materials, and other things. Where our goal going forward is to be able to see the labor opportunities for streamlining through learning. So um, we have at least a structure to work from that we're working on but we don't have, and this is w where I think where the uncertainty really gets crucial, is how quickly we can reduce labor force from, say, the first stick belt plant down into when you go into the nth of a kind. So that, that economy uh, is something that we're going to be really focusing on going forward. Yeah. And, and uh, just to add, I mean, that is a key question precisely for uh, modular construction. You wouldn't have that for stick belt plants. But you certainly have it here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, OK, Ed? Ed. Let's go with Ed. Yeah. Can, I, can I piggyback on that before you get to Ed? OK, okay sure. Yeah. This is Gil Brown. About the um, people on site, you were talking about construction, I think, in that last uh, piece. How about in the O&M part? How about, or is that not relevant? Um, on the O&M part, we do have quite a bit of analysis on that. Uh, we do a, a learning rate on an O&M, and um, um, let, let's in the O&M again. The O&M uh, is a comp as it uh, as it, uh, it is a percentage of the LCOE is still relatively small. Uh, however. The O&M, in terms of metrics, is important because it gives you an indication how uh, mechanized and how, mo how you can do this much more efficiently. And I think Joe, in his business case analysis, and I'll pick up with Joe, has some information on the O&M side of the equation. Yeah, there was, and I, uh, I have to admit, though, I think that was most of that work was done by uh, 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 Dr. Rothwell when he put together the model. Um, and I don't recall what those numbers are, but, but as Steve said, it, it, it turned out to be very, very a small component of the total uh, LCOE, so we really did not see that as a, as a big issue as far as a cost driver. Okay, we had, yeah, oh, we have, okay. On the O&M side, uh, did you figure in the cost of security? Uh, the security force on current plants if we had to size it for that same size is uh, $30 million a year or so, uh, can these plants be manned with lower security forces because they're underground or for other reasons? Yeah, but you're getting now into, uh, into the fidelity of uh, security and how NRC is going to pass judgment on, on the, you know, the major issues. Bob touched on it a little bit in his introductory remarks, security emergency planning, uh, you know, health physics, uh, the issue of operators, how many operators per unit. So you're getting into right into the details. I don't know if our study is going to be as satisfactory to your question because it really gets down into specific designs and specific decisions made by the NRC on how they're going to allow for security, how much, what's the footprint for security. And so I don't think we, either Rothwell's working papers or this report will actually address that issue. And maybe the thing to add is, of course, what you're alluding to is that uh, proponents do argue that uh, if, you, uh, if you leave the risk profile the same, that is, you don't increase risks, that, uh, that uh, there, in principle, that you could reduce the costs, okay? With, but the NRC will have to deal with that. That clearly is not something that we touched. Yeah, yeah I think you're up. Sorry, Mike, yeah. It's coming, it's coming. Uh, thanks. Uh, one, one of the safety issues that became more clear after Fukushima was the interaction between multiple units at a site. Mm -hmm. And that does raise the issue of if you substitute one large reactor for the equivalent number of small reactors, what is the minimum uh, physical spacing between those units? What is the, how do you have to harden 
the barriers between them, how do you have to provide, uh, to what extent you have to provide redundant equipment um, and other systems for each unit. And so how have you, uh, have you thought about how to factor in those issues? So, yeah, so, uh, so the, the, the answer is that uh, we have not looked at that. Uh, those are important questions. And uh, the whole issue of common mode failure, things like that, are, are obviously things that have to be examined. And I think that's, that's, again, one of the areas that the NRC will have to uh, deal with, absolutely. Hi, my name is Yong Soo Hang, originally from South Korea, and uh, we are developing the modular reactor, and uh, we are now at the stage of the licensing review at this moment. And even though we have a good combination of the NTSS designing people and the pure manufacturers and the component manufacturers like the Tucson Heavy Industry and the BOP uh, designers, we somehow concluded that the price for the small modular reactor might be too expensive unless you are also going for the either desalination or district heat. And we have some number, but I cannot uh, release to the audience. And since there is a big uh, economic burden, even though the uh, operation and the maintenance cost is relatively cheap, we calculate all the details, uh, still it's very expensive. So do you actually believe that it can be accepted by the industry within the next 15 years or something like that? Um, I'll, I'll go for it, and I'm going to give it to Joe as well. Um, I am familiar with your uh, co-generation uh, modeling, because although we didn't do it in this study, in an earlier study that I supported the Department of Energy on, we looked at co-generation for a small grid uh, in the Middle East, and we looked at desal and electricity and the trade-off, and if you do more desal, you, you don't need as much electricity. So I am familiar with your question. For the scope of our study here, we assumed that it would be all electricity as the output, but we also assumed that it would be a lot of production of these SMRs, that, that as Bob was discussing, the order book is so crucial, and that there would be international markets for the SMRs as well as, as, well as the U markets in the U.S. So in order for this to work uh, and be in the economic range that uh, your, the Koreans are looking at, you would need to bring these uh, overnight costs down significantly and to get into the competitive range. Joe? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I would just add that, I, as Steve said, we did not look at the option of, um, of uh, cogeneration or uh, uh, heat applications, but clearly that would definitely improve the economics. I would just simply point out that with the SMR type configuration, as, as Bob pointed out in his presentation, not only can you reach out to different markets, the SMRs would be much more um, suitable for the types of markets for uh, uh, heat applications, both for large industrials as well as uh, commercial and, uh, and district heating. So I think there, there is a, another large potential upside, if you will, to the economics of SMRs looking at that particular option. Yes. Yeah, I have an additional question. So actually, the U.S. and the South Korea are not countries who are actually working on the development of small and modular reactor. How do you see the, uh, the Russian technology? Actually, we are very concerned about the economic benefit of Russian technology. So what if the somebody in Southeast Asian country would like to import the Russian technology with the floating ship, that kind of thing? then they can actually have a big financial benefit. So how do you see the competitiveness of the, your SMR mm -hmm. uh, compared with the Russian technology? Uh, yeah, we did not do a technology trade analysis of, of, of the different technologies. There are other studies. The OECD NEA study looks at a variety of, of international technologies, the Russian technology, the Korean technology. Uh, various U.S. technologies. One thing I will say that's important here, our focus has been more in the nearer term technology in the study. So we looked specifically at a light water reactor 
passive technology. There are others out there too, including technology we're developing at Oregon National Lab, liquid metal technology, gas cooled technology, uh, wet bismuth, you know, molten salt technology, uh, and least, not last but not least, last but not least is the technology that's being developed by, at uh, TerraPower. So we we think that, and that could very well be in the game for that design uh, issues that we that Bob talks about. But we in this study did not uh, dwell in these other alternatives. Jim Gripshaw, Lockheed Martin. They, yeah. They, uh, oh, yes. An earlier questioner asked about the comparison between a, uh, a bank of SMRs that was the equivalent size of uh, a large reactor. Did you look at that, or did, were you looking more to the, the uh, placement of the SMRs at places like the grids that uh, couldn't accept the large reactors? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Let me uh, answer the question, and then I'll turn it over to Joe. Um, during the study, we did consider the trade-off between a, putting up a large, big reactor in versus um, uh, uh, several small reactors. Uh, at the end of the day, we figured that we should get SMRs on its merits head-to-head -head with natural gas because that's really the crux of the trade-off. It should, it, we should view uh, uh, the conventional reactors and the SMRs as complements to each other. I mean, it, get, it gives you a spectrum of choices. So we, in reality, we wanted to put SMRs up head-to-head -head with natural gas plants. Yeah, no, I think Steve answered it right on. But we looked at gas as the primary target, and, and we viewed the differences between small and large as being complementary rather than uh, uh, competitive. You address different markets. Yes, sir. Yes, Francois Dain, Francois Dain EDF. Um, SMR, uh, it's uh, a range of potential power. Uh, we have on the table potentially a power from uh, 45 megawatts to 300. Right. So right. It, it's not the same story right. in terms of technology right. and in terms of global economics. So mm -hmm. did you realize some uh, sensitivity study right. concerning the effect of the level of power concerning your results? Okay, well, uh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, the focus of our study was to look at the feasibility of SMRs as a concept. Okay. And so in our analysis and building the learning model and whatnot, we created, a, if you will, a hypothetical SMR configuration that does not represent, by design, does not represent any one vendor's current offering. And, and our purpose in doing that was really to look at the conceptual basis for the SMRs rather than to do a study to say that you know, vendor A's offering may be more uh, advantageous than vendor B's. I think going back to what, what uh, Bob presented earlier in this presentation, that we do think that, that if the Department of Energy does move forward with a program, that we would hope that they would support a variety of designs of, of different vendors early on so that to begin to develop the kinds of data that would allow for that better type of uh, trade-off in terms of the different sizes and configurations of uh, the different SMR technologies. Yeah. Maybe I can also add that, that uh, very much related to this is um, the marketplace. Um, one of the key questions will be who funds the learning curve? And that, that, the answer to that may be quite sensitive to the nature of the plant that you're actually proposing. other questions? Vic. Yeah, uh, I'd like to I need the mic. <laughs> so let me, let me uh, ask this to Bob. Uh, this is an epic question. All right. And, and epic and epic? Epic and epic, epic since epic you name the name. And, <laughs> and that, is, question. <laughs> that is, uh, I have not heard the, I'm, I'm trying to listen very carefully. Yeah. You've never mentioned climate. Right. Gee, one of the reasons that one really is interested in nuclear in general, and perhaps small modular mm -hmm. 
in particular is its impact on the climate problem. Right. right. Now, you didn't do that in the study because right. I, I'm right. You should, so I'm asking you the epic question beyond that because epics has right. to deal with the environment yep. and has to deal with these larger pictures. That's right. what epic means, right. right? So what is your, after now that you've done that, what do you, where do you see the role of SMRs in basically dealing with the climate issue? I'd be issue? glad to answer that question. Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, as a preliminary, let me just say that I'm a climate change believer. That's the first point, okay? Just so you know where I'm coming from. And the second is that I'm also a deep believer in the maxim that um, uh, if you're going to have a, uh, do something about it, uh, you better bet on things that you can be reasonably certain about. Uh, so if you look at the green technologies that are out there that, um, and you ask the question, which are available, that is, the, they're, they're doable, they're accomplishable, for, where the R&D basically has been done from the technolo technology point of view, and which have a shot at being uh, economically competitive with things that, that are carbon producing, the answer is nuclear is probably the only one, in my opinion. If I can just add to what Bob said, I think if you look at what we do say in the report, while we don't address climate directly, we point out that even the early stage uh, modules before one gets down this learning curve still look very competitive relative to other forms of carbon-free generation, particularly Absolutely. Re Absolutely. renewable energy. Absolutely. And when you consider the fact that this would be base load power and not intermittent power, I think if one were looking for a carbon-free source of generation, this would compare very favorably. Right. Our ultimate target, obviously, is, is natural gas, which was a, is a low-carbon generation source. And again, we think that with the learning curve um, opportunities, uh, and again, depending upon future prices, that, that in fact those two uh, points can converge and, 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 uh, and SMRs could be looked at as a very favorable option. Now, obviously, if there was such a thing as a carbon price, that would just do that much more to spur the, as we see it, the learning curve, and, and perhaps uh, uh, help in a way of providing an additional incentive. Yeah, and what we did, and, and I think uh, back to Vic's good question, is we tried to be, at the, at the reference case, a future where we didn't necessarily have a carbon price in there, and when Joe did his, Analysis that you'll see in the, in the uh, in terms of federal support when you get into the if you get a, from the lead into what we call the first of a kind plants you even without a carbon uh, price there are some opportunities with some production tax credits that we have uh, identified that could be put on the uh, put on uh, given to investors who invest in first of a kind plants. We can see that there are favorable competitive advantages to, to be investing in first of a kind plants. Yes, sir. One more question on natural gas. The Potential Gas Committee does a uh, study every two years of the total, the total that they uh, project right now for proven, probable, possible, and speculative resources in the U.S. is 2,170 trillion cubic feet which sounds like a lot until you realize that we burn 24 trillion cubic feet per year right now. Mm -hmm. uh, simple math, that's 90 years. Uh, my granddaughter will probably still be alive 90 years from now. Right. So I that's think that's a pretty scary prospect. Right. You're making the point Bob has been making and he's been making continuously in our study that eventually natural gas will move expensive. toward a BTU equivalent. Uh, market that there, that you'll get a situation where w that band that Bob presents will be moving toward up up the band up in the band, right. which means the crossover point that SMRs could have could be at a, w a fewer number of modules, which right. is favorable for SMRs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sam Waldman from MIT. Um, following the question about costs for carbon uh, did you include costs for nuclear waste and and future liability for nuclear waste and how do you uh, how do you how do yes. you see that playing out okay well we, we, all, we need that question as well because uh, we don't know what the BRC is going to say at the end so we don't know what their you know what their program is going to look like and how much it's going to cost but let me 
let me sort of give you uh, what we did. What we did is we put in a waste fee in the calculation. You'll see it identified as a waste fee, and it's assumed to be one mil per kilowatt hour. Now, do we have a basis that it's going to be higher? No, but um, I think Bob and I have certain views about that. And uh, Bob, you want to articulate your view? Um, it, it's hard to see how it's going to be much higher than that. And no matter what you think about that, uh, it's not a major cost factor as far as the uh, levelized cost of electricity is concerned. It's not. It's not really cost driving. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much for attending, and we Thank really you. appreciate your questions. Thank you.